In June of 1953, in Sing Sing Prison, New York, the first American couple to be convicted of espionage was executed. As of today, their case is still discussed because the truth behind their story is not so clear. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, we seriously would not be running. Thank you so, so, so much. If you would like to join our Patreon and our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to be talking about the case of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Now, before we get into the case, once again, I do want to offer my apologies. If you hear any banging around, I obviously, the construction is still going on. For those who might be new to this channel, I do live in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia, like right smack dab in the middle of the city. And literally less than 10 feet from my window, they are building a high rise and it is extremely loud. And so I apologize if you hear subtle banging in the background, there is not much I can do about it, unfortunately. Now, before we get into the story, I, I would encourage you watching right now, once we finish this, to go and do your own investigation and your own research into the case of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. On the outside of things, just giving a quick glance at this case, it would seem that the United States government did what was right that they executed two people who basically were convicted of treason against the American people. However, the truth of this case is way more complicated. And the deeper and deeper and deeper you look into this case, the more you start to realize that it's not, it's not so black and white. And for me personally, as I was researching this case, I saw a lot of similarities between the culture of the 1950s and the culture of 2023. It's very interesting to me that human beings have the propensity to become hypnotized. Human beings tend to grasp onto any truth that they deem to be truth and fight for it to the death. Human beings also have the propensity to be vigilante, even if vigilante behavior is more violent, the justice for the crime they believe they are fighting against. And I think that the case of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, if we were to really, really t viscerally take this information in, we would make better choices in the future when it comes to things like law and order yes it is true that at least julius rosenberg was most definitely a spy for the soviet union but again as you will see the evidence might not be what you think it is now for me i was born in 1983 i was born 30 years after their execution however my mother used to tell us stories as we were growing up about her experience in her childhood and her fear of the Cold War. My mother would tell us growing up ab about drills that they would have to do in their school in case the Soviet Union were to attack. Now, my mother was born in the late 50s, so she grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And as we get into the case of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, hopefully you will see just how long this hysteria was going on. Now, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were both first generation Americans. Between 1880 and 1920, there was a mass exodus from Eastern Europe, particularly Russia, of Jewish people. In fact, during that 40 year window, 2 million Jews started their new life in New York. 
Now, generally speaking, I do feel like regardless of what generation your ancestors immigrated here or under whatever circumstances your ancestors immigrated here, I can imagine that, especially for the first generation Americans, there can be quite a struggle. You're struggling against the culture of the old world while living out the culture of the new world. Even though Julius and Ethel were born here in America, I'm sure in a lot of ways there were fantasies about the motherland. After all, for many humans, we often think the grass is greener on the other side. Now, between 1880 and 1920, we don't just see the exodus of Jewish people. I'm going to be honest with you guys. There are a lot of people that came over from Eastern Europe during this time, including one of my great, great grandparents. My grandfather's mother's parents immigrated here from Eastern Germany in the late 1800s. Of course, we know that situations politically typically don't spring up overnight. And at this point, we're watching Eastern Europe and Germany barreling into mass war in the early 20th century. This is leading up to World War I, World War II, and then the Cold War with the Iron Curtain falling for the USSR. So I can understand this just from hearing stories from my grandfather about his grandparents' trip over here from Germany. There was a desperation. So it's not when I talk about two million Jewish people coming to New York City, I, I want to make that clear. Even though this story is about a Jewish couple, it wasn't just, this was a human problem, right? This was a problem with humanity that was building up in Eastern Europe and people needed a place to escape because I think a lot of people saw the writing on the wall. Julius Rosenberg was born on May 12, 1918 in New York City. Ethel Greenglass Rosenberg was born on September 28, 1915, also in New York City. Now, to understand why certain people behave or believe the things that they believe, it's very important for us to look back at the circumstances of their childhood. Childhood trauma is definitely a thing, and it definitely affects the way that human beings go about their adult lives. Ethel and Julius spent their formative years during the 1930s, which was the bulk of the Great Depression, worldwide but i'll focus more on what was happening in the united states during the great depression especially looking at new york city now if we look back at the history of the united states any time there has been an influx of a certain ethnic group of people that group of people typically becomes targeted by the mass majority this was true with the Irish people, the potato famine. I covered a story back when I first opened my channel about um, an Irish family that ended up immigrating to Savannah, Georgia, because the ports in New York ended up closing to Irish people because so many Irish people had moved into New York and they were taking over jobs. And so the citizens of New York were like, hell no, go elsewhere. And I will put that playlist for Savannah down in the description box below if you guys want to go back and take a look at this. So when I talk about the anti-Semitism that was happening in New York City, no forms of racism are good. They're all bad. But we also have to remember that this is a common behavior with humanity. Anytime there's an influx of one group and that group starts to take over things like jobs, they become the target of the, the OG people, the original people that were there. So when I talk about this, I, I don't, in a lot of ways, I think people sometimes take their frustration out on others and they might cling to things like their race, but it really is just a projection of their own insecurities. And during the Great Depression, this was amplified tenfold. The Great Depression for anybody, regardless of what their ethnic heritage is, is a, a trauma that is still playing itself out even today. Many of my friends growing up had grandparents that lost everything in the Great Depression. And you would see that playing out in their home lives. Some grandparents saying, you've got to finish your plate. You've got to eat all the food you can. 
hoarding became a, a problem as an effect from things like the Great Depression. And fortunately for me, and hopefully for many of you, you watching, we've never experienced poverty like the poverty that the people in the 1930s experienced. At this point, you saw people standing in line for hours just to get free food at a soup kitchen. Another thing is that there were no tenant rights. So nowadays, if you are renting an apartment, there are tenant rights that secure you. Yes, you can be evicted, but it takes a lot to get somebody evicted. At this point, though, none of that existed. And so living in a place like Manhattan in New York, where there are so many people anyway, and constantly on a daily basis, seeing people starving, seeing people's furniture and belongings being thrown out on the street from their landlord because they couldn't they couldn't pay their rent. People were trying to even sell their children. That's how desperate they were for money. This was again a trauma like probably none of us in America in America have experienced or hopefully will ever experience again. Even the crash of 2008 was nothing compared to the Great Depression. So here we have Julius and Ethel Julius Rose, uh, Rosenberg and Ethel Greenglass at this point growing up with this trauma. On top of that, they are first generation Americans and they are Jewish. And so they are being blamed for the loss of jobs. They are being blamed by the general public for why things are not panning out the way that it's supposed to pan out for this American dream. Needless to say, life was very hard for Ethel and Julius. People had lost faith in the American version of capitalism. And so as what typically does in the history of humanity, the pendulum will sp swing from one extreme side all the way to another extreme side. And so for many of the young people trying to find some sort of escape, some sort of answer for all of their problems, they clung to this idea, this philosophy, this government called communism. In their mind, they believed that Russia was a utopia. In fact, Julius became a leader for the Young Communist League USA at City College of New York. This is where he would go on to graduate with a degree in electrical engineering. Now, one professor in a lecture I listened to claimed that during this time period at City College in New York, we think about Berkeley in the 1960s, and I, I wasn't around for Berkeley in the 1960s, but I know about it. it. It was a pretty big deal. There were all these riots and revolutions coming out of this college. But according to this professor, during this time, many a few generations before at City College New York, what was happening, the revolution, the ideas that were happening at City College made Berkeley look like child's play. Now, the Young Communist League USA, or YCL USA, is a youth organization whose stated aim is to develop its members into communists by studying Marxism, Leninism, and actively participating in the struggles of the American working class. Which, I mean, holy crap, the struggles of the working class were the theme of any child growing up in the and the Great Depression. Something interesting, though, when I was researching this, this actual organization that Julius was a leader in reestablished itself in 2019. I kind of laugh when I say that because it scares the shit out of me. It's an uncomfortable laugh. Now, Ethel Greenglass Rosenberg, when she was growing up, she had aspirations to be an opera singer. Apparently, Ethel had an amazing voice, and that was her dream, was just to stand on that stage and sing. But unfortunately, as many people's dreams die, so did Ethel when she ended up taking a job as a secretary at a shipping company. Now, while she was working this job, she became involved in a labor dispute. And this labor dispute is what introduced Ethel to the Young Communist League in 1936. This is where Ethel met Julius, and in 1939, the two were married. In 1940, Julius got a job with the United States Army, 
working at the Army Signal Corporation as an engineer inspector. And by this point, the Rosenbergs themselves were doing pretty well financially. They were able to move into a nicer apartment in a nicer area of New York. Now, Julius did not hide the fact that he was a communist. He was very, he was, he was a card carrying communist. Like he was literally registered as a communist, something the United States government knew when they hired him. His job at the United States Army would last for five years and he was fired in 1945 due to his communist leanings. Now, a lot happened between 1940 and 1945, stuff that we need to talk about to understand the complexities of this case. First of all, the Rosenbergs had their first son in 1943. They would go on to have their second son in 1947, when Julius was at his new job, which we will get into. Now, during this time, as I said, there was a lot going on in the world. There was mass hysteria everywhere. Not only are we coming off of the heels of the Great Depression, but we've got World War II looming. Hitler is doing his fascism over here. We've got the armies of Russia fighting up against Hitler. And pretty soon, Hitler invaded Russia. By 1942, Russia and the USA were allies. This is not something that I was aware of before I started doing my research. And this is frankly what changed my mind about a lot of Julius's charges. This is around the time that it is alleged that Julius started spying for Russia. I guess I shouldn't really say alleged. I mean, he literally, it's in the documents. He was literally spying for Russia. However, Russia at this time was our ally. So if I think about this in our modern times, our greatest, as the United States, our greatest ally, our strongest ally is United Kingdom. And so we know that the British military and the American military often work side by side and with each other in a lot of world issues. And so for an American to spy for the United Kingdom, especially since we're such tight allies, doesn't scream treason. You know, it's because you're helping somebody that has your back. You're working with a government that is your government's best friend. So you're not trying to sabotage your own people if you're working for a government that also supports your people. You see how this gets a little bit murky? So around this same time in 1942, where Hitler's invading Russia, Russia becomes besties with the United States, we had something else going on. And this was called the Manhattan Project. Many people, especially if you are in this community, know a lot about the Manhattan Project. And it seems that Ethel herself had a kid brother named David, David Greenglass. Now, it's kind of comical. David, again, this Jewish professor I listened to who was freaking awesome. I really enjoyed his lecture. He was kind of funny talking about da little old David Greenglass, Ethel's kid brother. David apparently was kind of the pudgy kid, like really kind of just did not have a lot going for him. Apparently, he wasn't that smart when it came to like academics, failed out of his first semester of college was a little too fat to go and fight in the war. And so they gave him, he, he was like pushing papers at a desk, but he was really good at machinery. So the U.S. government sent David Greenglass to Los Alamos to work on the Manhattan Project. Now, for those who don't know what the Manhattan Project is, that's basically where they were creating the atom B-O-M-B, since they can't say that word on YouTube. Basically, this is a big deal. So David Greenglass is over working on this new project for the American government. He's in New Mexico. His wife, Ruth, is still in New York with uh, Julius and Ethel. And this is where the story starts to get really, really interesting. So it's claimed that Julius was spying for the Russians and David is over in uh, his brother-in-law is over in New Mexico working on this Adam B-O-M-B, Ruth, the sister-in-law, is hanging out in New York with Julius and Ethel. And finally, they say, you know what, Ruth? I think you need to go and see your husband. Now, on these military bases, apparently, 
his sister, Ethel, would not have been allowed on to see her brother. Of course, the brother-in-law would not have been allowed on to see the brother, but the wife is a different story. Ruth could go and live with her husband, David, while he worked on this weapon. Now, remember, at this point, the United States and Russia are still allies. Of course, that would soon change. And this is the crux of why they got the death penalty. It all came down to this nuclear weapon. In 1944, Ruth heads to New Mexico, and it is claimed that Julius came up with a plan. Julius took a box of jello and cut it in half and gave half to Ruth and told her that when a carrier comes, he'll show the other half of the jello box so that Ruth would know he was legit and knew she could trust him to hand over information about the atomic BOMB. Again, as I said, by 1945, by the following year, the United States government fired Julius Rosenberg from his position with the United States Army due to him being a registered communist. But have no fear because fate and destiny is here. Julius then starts working for Emerson Radio. Emerson Radio takes jobs for the United States government. So now Julius has an even better way of getting all of this information to the Soviet Union. So Ruth Greenglass, the wife of David Greenglass, is now off in New Mexico while her husband is working on these weapons. Around this time, Julius back in New York is getting fired from the army for being a communist and gets a job at Emerson Radio. And a man named Harry Gold shows up in New Mexico wanting to speak to Ruth. When he sees Ruth, he shows Ruth the other half of the jello packet. So Ruth knows he is the man that she is supposed to give her husband's sketches of the atomic BOMB to. In 1945, the United States drops two of its BOMBs over Japan. Now, it is said that these are these were literally like the only two we actually had were the two that we dropped over Japan. I don't know if I believe that, uh, but even if that were true, as this awesome professor, which I'll put his his lecture down in the description box below, as he said, like. The Japanese didn't need to know that. Like, all of a sudden, people feared the United States. We all of a sudden were a top dog on this planet because we had these weapons of mass destruction, basically, at our fingertips. So now people were like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. We can't piss off the United States because they could literally annihilate us because of their weaponry. So the United States is walking around with its chest up knowing that no one would dare try to invade us because look what we look what we got we can like take you out in 1945 world war ii ends and the iron curtain is dropped over the soviet union and most of eastern europe at this point russia is no longer our allies i mean the russia is not even in a strange friend at this point at this point the tides have turned and russia becomes public enemy number one and what I thought was really fascinating, because I, I remember when the Berlin Wall came down, I was a young child. I remember my father calling my siblings and me into the living room to watch it come down on TV. But I didn't know what it was, but I remember it. But I, you know, I was a kid. So, yes, I was born at the tail end of this Cold War. My parents, on the other hand, spend the bulk of their lives, their first part of their lives, in this Cold War, which is my, which we're going to get into with some of the stories coming from this because it reminded me of stories my mother told me, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, but this Cold War, I, I didn't, I never questioned why it was called the Cold War and not the Hot War. It was called the Cold War initially. Because the Soviet Union, there was nothing they could do to the free United States because we were the one with the weapons, with the powerful weapons, right? And at 
after the war, there was no way that Russia was going to be able to to keep up with the United States. During the war, it is said that for one American soldier who was killed, 50 Russian soldiers were killed. So the USSR was in no place to try to spend extra time developing these fancy, uh, fancy gadgets and gizmos. Even during Hitler's reign of over fascist Germany, a lot of the German scientists were pulled from working on these fancy weapons in order to create other things. I have to be careful what I say on YouTube, guys, but you guys know what the scientists in Germany were doing during World War II. I don't need to go into it, but they were basically pulled back. So the United States really came out on top. Now, what was interesting, I thought that this uh, this uh, professor brought up is that even though people like in the in the normal world tend to think of like fascism and communism being like two extremes of a political spectrum they're actually not uh, i kind of knew that like even as a kid growing up they'd be like you know they show the picture hitler stalin and i'm like but it's the same picture like it's literally fascism and communism are the same it's all tyrannical dictatorship government control and this professor called them bedfellows which i thought was fantastic because i was like yes you yes mr professor jewish man you were awesome because they that's correct even though the uh jewish population were very sympathetic generally speaking sympathetic to uh, st the, the the communism stall the stalins i can see why because you know the holocaust happened and it was the Jewish people who were targeted. So I can understand why you have become sympathetic to the people fighting off the people hurting your people. But literally, those people are the same as the people fighting your people. Does that make sense? There's really no difference. There's literally no difference between communism and fascism. No difference. Censorship, government control, do as you say, rules for thee, not for me. It's all the same shit. But anyway, I digress. Tides have changed now. So in just a, a span of a few years, I mean, think about everything we've been through in, let's just say, since 2016. So the last seven years, think about how many different ways we've been pulled. Is this person good? Is this person bad? What are they up to? What are they not telling us? Can we read between the lines? Who's an infiltrator? Who's not? Who's infiltrating the other side? Think about how many times your mind has been in a tug of war between different political figures. And now take that experience and put it in an even shorter amount of time and you have the Rosenbergs. My friends, we're not so different from this, this couple who was executed for treason. Because in 1942, the Russians were our allies. Three years later, in 1945, the Russians were public enemy number one. So three years prior, it was totally fine for Julius Rosenberg to be spying for the Russians. But the minute the tables turned, it wasn't okay. I mean, judge not least, you be judged, right? There's an empathy that I have for this, this couple, even though I myself think communism is a horrific governmental system as a human being i can understand why the rosenbergs would cling to communism i get it i get as much of it as i can as a person living in 2023 i have empathy and compassion for this couple and for me personally i i don't think they meant to hurt anybody i think they were just trying to figure out a way to make the world right again so as i said Japan was attacked in 1945. The Iron Curtain fell. Russia became public enemy number one, or rather the USSR became public enemy number one, and the Cold War began. Again, in 1945, the attitude of the American people was, oh, it's fine, that's why it's a Cold War. We have all the power. We have the atomic BOMBs, they don't they're not going to attack us because we'll just blow their country to smithereens if they do. So we can, we can rest ashore. We can rest in our laurels that we're fine. 
But then four years later in 1949, something happened that drastically changed the attitude of the American people and drastically changed the fate of the Rosenbergs. In 1949, a high amount of radiation was detected coming from Russia. The United States freaked out. This amount of radiation coming from Russia meant only one thing. They had their own atomic BOMB. And it was later confirmed on August 29th of 1949, one was exploded over a vacant area of Siberia. It was like a testing run. Now the United States wasn't so safe because now Stalin had the bomb. Again, mass hysteria picked up all over the United States. All of a sudden, kids were taught these drills. And my mother, again, my mother was born, both my parents were born in the late 50s. So even over a decade later, my mother remembers doing um, duck and cover drills where they would have a siren go off. You know, at this point, the Bay of Pigs was a big thing and they would have to learn how to cover under the desk in case a BOMB was dropped. So even into the 60s, they were still running these drills. The people, the private citizens of the United States were freaking terrified. For a generation that at one point felt safe and now doesn't feel safe, that's extremely stressful. And of course, this type of fear can be used and can be manipulated. Because around this time, we had the beginnings of McCarthyism. And this is, of course, named after Senator Joe McCarthy. And I'm going to be really honest with you guys, even though I think communism is an absolute disgrace to human humanity, I don't, I don't like Joe McCarthy. I, that man terrifies the shit. He scares me. like that. And I fear, looking at these behavior patterns, I actually fear that this is what's coming for us again, this, this form of McCarthyism to the extreme. And even though Senator McCarthy was right about a lot of people, he was also gravely wrong about a lot of people. Joe McCarthy, in my opinion, was almost like a, a fundamentalist vigilante when it came to trying to pursue the demonic being of communism. And yes, again, I'm going to reiterate for those that are listening and not are not hearing what I'm saying. Two things get to be true. All right. We need this is probably the most important saying of our modern times that people need to take in. Two things get to be true. It is true that communism is a nasty, horrific thing that humanity has had to go through. That is very true. Com there is nothing good about communism. It is completely evil. It's also true, in my opinion, that Joe McCarthy himself was an evil son of a bitch too. Joe McCarthy believed that there were Russian spies. There were communist spies here in the United States. He was right about that. There were spies here in the United States. But the way that he went on his watchdog attack was completely wrong. Because again, even though he got some people right, he got a hell of a lot of people wrong. And in getting people wrong, he ruined their lives. Hear me when I say this. He ruined their lives. But if you think about what Joe McCarthy did, he literally, and he ruined people. He ruined their lives for no reason, for his own egotistical, narcissistic, power-hungry crusade. We see that happening now, especially on platforms like Telegram, where people get an idea about someone or, or they don't like someone, and so they create stories about them and try to create a vigilante response to that person, trying to ruin that person's life without any proof. This is the problem with McCarthyism. McCarthyism was chaos, destructive chaos, disguised as law and order. And if you go back, I watched some of the videos, the video footage they have of some of these investigations and trials that McCarthy ran. Holy fucking God. Talk about a banana republic. It's horrific. I think, Sen I think people like Senator Joe McCarthy are just as dangerous as people like Stalin and Hitler and Lenin and Mao. So anyway, back to the Rosenbergs. 
So it's 1949. We know now that Russia's got the same weapons that we have heaven forbid now we're in trouble because we were the ones that threw the first punch against japan who sided with the axis side of the war and now they have the same ammunition like literally that we have and so now the tables have turned people are panicked they're running duck and cover drills in schools they're running commercials on how to protect yourself it's all over the newspapers you got senator mccarthy doing his wild wild west takedown of american of simple american citizens who are being accused of i mean it's just freaking it's fucking crazy and it so reminds me of what we're going through right now and that's what's terrifying that is what's terrifying there is no logic anywhere it is all just my opinion is what's right your opinion is what's wrong it is freaking lunacy at this point but while all this chaos and hectic energy is going around the general public the united states government is starting to investigate how the hell russia got everything they needed to create their own weapon again it's not it's not logical that i will say like that that was true the united states was like common sense i mean common sense ain't so common anymore but common sense would tell you like the russians were given this there's no way that the russians could have done this on their own at this time because of the devastation that the ussr went through after post-world war ii there, there was just no way that they would have had the time the energy the resources to figure this out on their own somebody had to have given them the information in order for them to create this themselves klaus fuchs was a german physicist he was a very very good very smart very talented physicist who also happened to be a communist during World War II, Fuchs sought asylum in Great Britain. Because Great Britain and the United States are such strong allies, during the Manhattan Project, the creation of these nuclear weapons, the United States requested that Great Britain send Klaus Fuchs to Los Alamos to help them work on the, the project. This was around the same time that david greenglass ethel's little brother was also there where ruth was doing her handoff with a guy with a jello packet it's all happening at the same time so after russia figured out how to keep up with the united states and the united states government started to do its own investigation they realized that klaus this physicist from great britain a la really from germany was a communist and most likely was a spy for the soviets and so on february 2nd 1950 klaus fuchs was apprehended well klaus fuchs like many people was not as brave and as badass as he thought he was because he folded like a cheap suit the minute they started to interrogate him he gave up a man named harry gold if you remember, Harry Gold was the man who brought half of the Jello packet to Ruth Greenglass, Julius, and Ethel Rosenberg's sister-in-law. In early May 1950, Gold was arrested, and he lasted a little bit longer than Fuchs in his interrogation. But on May 22nd, 1950, he also folded he confessed to being a spy and he gives up the name david greenglass and tells the authorities about the jello story the jello packet story on june 15 1950 david greenglass who is now living back in new york city where he's from is apprehended he folds quickly as well and he gives up his wife listen listen ladies listen linda if your husband gives you up in an FBI investigation, divorce his ass. Divorce his ass. That is some shady shit. I would rather my husband and cheat on me every night of the week than do that shit. Like, what a fucking coward. What a coward. But yes, he gave up his, his wife, Ruth Greenglass, 
his brother-in-law, Julius Rosenberg, and his own dear sister, Ethel Rosenberg. What a fucking coward. I mean, to give up your sister, too. Like, listen, if they were Southern, I don't think they would do that, because Southern men, they protect women. Next day, on June 16th, 19th, 50, Julius Rosenberg is brought in for questioning. So they didn't arrest him right away. They brought him in for questioning and they let him go home that night. However, the very next day, he too was arrested for the conspiracy to commit espionage. On August 11th, Ethel Rosenberg was also arrested for the conspiracy to commit espionage espionage and she is the one that i feel the most sorry for and we're going to talk about why that is because it's so fucked up what happened to her like truly truly but i do have to say the rosenbergs out of every single person in this situation the rosenbergs were the ones that were very stoic brave and they never folded they never gave anybody up they never told on anyone they were literally the true, true commies in the sense that they did not turn on their cohorts. There was also a third person who was arrested and I, I didn't really want to go into his story too much because it really doesn't have much to do with the Rosenbergs, even though they were all part of the same scheme. But I'm going to bring it up because he actually fled to Mexico and then he, the United States government got the Mexicans to like turn him in. And he ended up getting a, a pretty light sentence compared to the Rosenberg sentence, which is quite interesting. And that's the only reason why I bring it up because he's, and he's going to come into play a little bit later on in the story with some inter interesting things that he had to say about this later on in life about this whole situation which i thought again was very fascinating so just know that there was a third person that also ran to mexico named morty got brought back now even though david greenglass originally gave up his sister ethel there really wasn't a lot of evidence to support the fact that ethel herself was a spy yes she was registered as a communist but there's a huge difference between being registered as a communist and actually spying for the soviet union the original story under oath, as David said, was that he would sketch out the BOMB and his wife, Ruth, was the one that would write out the instructions because according to David himself, his handwriting was like chicken scratch. And so she had to be the one to fit, to actually write out the instructions to then hand to Harry Gold. Harry Gold got connected to them through Julius Rosenberg who again is the husband of Ethel, but again, Ethel's name in the beginning was never mentioned. For all intents and purposes, she had no idea what was going on. She was just a housewife at this point. And yeah, of course, yeah, she's a communist, but she, again, there's a big difference. Two things get to be true. You can be a communist and not want to commit treason against your fellow countrymen, right? Like, so she is the one that's, that's really got the most question marks around her especially when we get deeper into this case and what was found out later on by her her their children the trial begins on march 6 1951 and all three julius ethel rosenberg and this morty character that had run off to mexico just like keith ranere he ran off to mexico were all being tried at the same time the government's main witnesses were david greenglass ethel's little brother and ruth greenglass david's wife and ethel and julius's sister-in-law just something interesting i learned um the judge in this case was connected to the jesuits wrote that in my notes very interesting especially when we look back on things morty had to say about this later in life long after the fact so just keep that in mind that the judge was connected to the jesuits now at the trial david and ruth implicated ethel saying that she was the one who actually typed up the notes regarding the workings and the mechanics of the atomic bomb now remember though in the beginning when they first gave testimony, Ethel was never mentioned. It was actually Ruth herself that claimed she wrote out the note. So there's already a discrepancy between the indictment and the trial. The Rosenbergs were charged with Section 2 of the U.S. Espionage Act of 1917, Code 32. During the trial, the Korean War had also started my mom's dad was a medic in the korean war so it was literally like the atmosphere 
the atmosphere of the United States at this time was like McCarthyism, communism, bad. We just finished World War II. Now we got to do duck and cover. And people are literally, I mean, if I had lived in America during that time, I probably would have just like run off to the middle of nowhere and lived by myself because this is unbelievable, the amount of stress and the amount of propaganda and the amount of it, of just, just so many words I can't say right now because of censorship. <laughs> do you guys kind of get what I'm saying, right? There's like so much happening. There's so much being covered in the newspapers. There's so much fear in the American people. And now like the fear that your your next door neighbor, like the, the couple, this was a young go young couple in their 30s. Uh, you know, Ethel herself was the mother of two young children, two young boys. I mean, these are your next door neighbors. Like this is the woman who 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 makes brownies and brings it to like your family cookout. Like and now as as american people we can't even trust our next door neighbors like they might be communist spies you never know according to joe mccarthy whoever he feels like accusing of being a spy he's gonna accuse of being a spy so people are literally paranoid i mean this is the start of a huge cult basically people are paranoid of each other they're worried they're watching each other the uh, three-letter agency is being formed now to legally spy on people check out the birds aren't real episode on that one i'll put that down in the description box below there's just so much going on there is so much going on right and when this started when all of this started it was under president truman it ends under eisenhower which we're going to get into that too because some some things in this case made me very much second guess eisenhower i've been second guessing a lot lately um Frankly, and I don't want to piss people off. Like, I'm not trying to, like, take away your hope. But I don't even think they're freaking white hats anymore. I think they're, like, black hats and lesser black hats is basically where I am with this whole thing now. Because, holy shit. Like, the amount of just fucked upness that is happening, happening then, happening now, is unbelievable. It makes me really, truly believe what the Cassiopeians say, that only like 50% of people on this planet actually have a soul. There's some things about Eisenhower coming up in this story that make me just want to vomit. Like, the soul, what a soulless sack of shit when it came to some of this stuff. Excuse my language, but you'll see what I mean soon. When the jury convened, they only convened for seven hours, which is not good. You know, usually, I mean, the Danny Masterson trial that just happened out in LA, what they were convened for like two weeks. I mean, this is, you know, if a, if a jury is comes to the conclusion, their verdict, the unanimous verdict pretty quickly, it's, it's, it's either really good news or it's really bad news because it, there wasn't a lot of debate uh, between whether these people are guilty or innocent. And so they came back with three guilty verdicts for all three of them. Morty only got 30 years in prison. Ethel and Julius got sentenced to death by electric chair. Their conviction happened on April 5th, 1951, but it would take a little over two years before they were formally executed at Sing Sing Prison in New York. For those two years, people all over the world fought for their clemency. People in the United States were protesting the execution of these two people, especially for Ethel, who again was a mother of two young boys and what was happening was atrocious to the american people how how could the american government execute two of its own citizens many famous people all over the world pleaded with the government for clemency for both of them including the pope as i said at the start of this president truman who was a democrat was in office by the end of this president eisenhower a republican had been sworn in and the attitude was if they couldn't get a democrat to release these people on clemency there was no way they were going to get a republican to release them on clemency and this is what made me freaking sick to my stomach one of the sons of the rosenbergs wrote a letter to president eisenhower pleading for his parents' clemency. The letter was written in a child's handwriting. It is heartbreaking to see this letter. And allegedly, apparently, Eisenhower didn't even bother, bother to respond. What a sociopath, in my opinion. Didn't even bother to respond to a child's 
a small child whose parents' execution is being plastered all over the newspaper. Not just here in America, but all over the world. This is a child. This poor child doesn't know what communism is. He's a child. All he knows is that the government is about to kill his parents. How do we know decency? Regardless of whether the crime fit the punishment, regardless of whether they should have been executed or not, in my opinion, President Eisenhower should have addressed those boys. He should have at least, at the very least, very least, written them a letter back. If not have personally gone to see them or invited them to the White House to try his best to comfort these innocent American children for the trauma that they were about to go through at the hands of the U.S. government. Now, again, the execution was ordered because they gave the Russian people a copy of the atomic bomb. And their excuse was that this could be used against the American people. And yes, that is true. But how freaking arrogant are we? How narcissistically abusive are we? Did we not just drop two of those on Japan? Did we not just ruin and murder? Like higher than serial killer level murder a bunch of innocent Japanese people? And I get it. All is fair in love and war. I, I get that. I, I get that. They were part of the Axis side. We were part of the allies. But you dropped it on innocent people. You dropped it on innocent people. Those people in Japan were just living their lives. They were trying to be good parents, good mothers, good fathers, good husbands, good wives. They were trying to be good daughters and sons, good sisters, good brothers. They were ex they had things they were excited about. They had dreams. They had hopes. They had ambitions. And the American government annihilated them. What? To prove that we're better than everyone else? To puff our chest out? And the minute that table gets turned on us, the minute there's a possibility that that might be used against innocent American people, not saying that that's right either, all of a sudden we now have to execute a couple. When literally the United States government is guilty of the crime that didn't actually happen, that could have happened, but didn't. It's like the Rosenbergs are the scapegoats for the karma that the military ran against the Japanese people, if that makes sense. It just, it doesn't make sense, actually. It's pretty fucked up. There were some complications leading up to their execution, which I, again, I will place some documentaries, some lectures down in the description box for you to do your own due diligence and do your own homework regarding what happened in this case. I, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a historical attorney. So I, I don't want to mm -hmm. misspeak when I talk about the regulations of the state of ex execution, like what was happening legally, they ended up having to bump up the execution date because of the Jewish faith. They, they didn't want to execute them past sundown because they were going to be executed on a Friday. And it has to do a lot with, I believe, Shabbat. And so the government did not give the Rosenbergs a last meal because they rushed to get the executioner there to be able to make sure that they were um, dead by sundown. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were executed on June 19th of 1953 in St. Fiend Prison in New York. They were allowed about 30 minutes before the execution to see each other and spend time with each other. However, they were placed together with a grate in between them, so they really couldn't even physically hold each other. Julius Rosenberg went first. At 8.02 p.m., they walked Julius into the chamber. They hooked him up to the chair, or they gave him 2,500 hertz of electric shock. By 8.06, Julius was pronounced dead. At 8.11, Ethel Rosenberg was brought into the chamber. 
They hooked her up to the chair, and they gave her the same 2,500 hertz of electric shock. Ethel Rosenberg was much smaller than her husband. This should have killed her instantly, but it did not. After the first round, the doctor checked her heart, and it was still beating, and so they had to do it again. At this point, the sun was already setting, but it didn't matter. They just kept going. At 8.16, people who were watching the execution said, before the final blow, her body had been fried so badly that smoke came out of her head. After the execution, Michael and Robert Rosenberg, the sons of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, were adopted by another family who were also communist. This allowed the children to officially change their last name, which I personally believe was really smart, a smart thing to do so that these boys did not have a stigma on them for the rest of their lives. Even though they both came from pretty, had pretty big families on both sides of the family, it just, it was really, I, I personally, I don't know these people, so I might be misspeaking, but I just, as an outsider looking in, I think that was the best thing to do to give them a clean shot at a new life. David Greenglass, the little brother of Ethel Rosenberg, who was the state's main witness and turned them in, he only served 10 years in prison. In 1975, Michael and Robert sued the United States government for more information on their parents' trial. And in 1995, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, all files were released regarding the trial. It became very clear at that point that their parents were technically guilty of being a spy, especially their father. However, what became apparent was that David Greenglass and Ruth Greenglass targeted Ethel in order for David to serve lesser time and Ruth not to be indicted at all. Now, Morty, the third person, would go on to live out his 30 years in prison. And according to the Jewish professor I listened to back in 2018, he was still alive and kicking at an elderly um, retirement center. He started screaming about all of this being nothing but a cover-up from the American cabal. My heart truly goes out to people who were connected to this case. I cannot imagine what those two boys went through. And there are so many incredible documentaries. In fact, in fact, one of the granddaughters of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg did make a documentary. This documentary is called Heir to an Execution, a Granddaughter's Story. I will put all these links down in the description box below, but I'm hoping that this story, out of all the stories I've covered on this channel, I'm hoping that this story motivates people to do their own research, to not just follow what other people are saying, but to really think for themselves. Because when we get caught up in hysteria and derangement and delusion, innocent people lose their lives. I don't know what the answer is. I wasn't around at this time. I don't know if they were truly innocent and these crimes were fabricated against them. I don't know if they were doing what they said they, they were accused of doing, but yet there was some type of confusion due to Russia at one point mm -hmm. being our ally and then not being our ally. All I know is that something isn't right about this case. And I think that's why this case still lives on in our culture and why people still talk about this case. And again, I don't know what the answer is. All I know is that moving forward, I pray to God that we learn, that we as the people, not the government, but the people learn from this and not allow this to ever happen again. Anyway, you guys, let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. I'll talk to you soon.